Every time you speak with a property owner, you have options. Now, wholesaling, obviously, the the base uh, conversation that we have with property owners is, is about a cash offer. It's about here's a cash as is offer that we can offer these property owners because what we're really looking for is they want to trade speed and convenience for potential equity. Well, what happens when they don't? What happens if they're stuck on a price that's too high? What happens if they do want to sell the property, but they don't want all the cash out of it right away because they don't know what they're going to do with it. They don't want to pay taxes on it this year. They want to sell it. They just haven't made the decision to sell it because they, they just haven't really found the right terms. That's an important word for this podcast, the right terms that would make them happy with the sale of that property. That's why I've got out of Tampa Bay, Florida, an incredible rhino. This guy is charging like nobody I know. He's been charging for the last couple of years and built an incredible business. Uh, Nick Camarada. Nick, say hello again for the second time on the podcast. How are we doing, Brent? Thanks for having me back, man. Happy to be here. I am going to grill you so hard on this podcast. We're going to give so much value. Guys, for real, you need a pen. You need a paper. If you are running on a treadmill, if you're walking around the neighborhood, if you are driving, this is definitely going to be a podcast that you listen to twice because every single one of us has been on a phone with a property owner and they do not want a low price cash offer on their property. Okay? So what happens... How do we transition this, Nick? If you're talking to somebody and and you know that they're in a tricky situation or it's on one of your lists and and they say, "Well, I'm stuck at 150,000 and you want this property for 100,000 and it's not in terrible shape. It's not totally remodeled, but it's not in terrible shape." In your mind right now, what how do you transition this conversation so you don't go, "Well, I can only offer you 100,000." and totally lose them forever and be able to switch this into something that's a little bit more creative, a little bit more seller financing and or just creative terms. Sure. <clears throat> sure. So yeah, we, everything that we market for, or we all, we're always pushing the cash offer first and then we kind of disqualify leads for a cash purchase. And then if that doesn't work out, then we try the other options, you know, seller finance, uh, subject to if there's a mortgage or a novation deal, uh, or novation agreement, if that's an option for them. But the way that we kind of transition that conversation in the situation where if they want 150 and the most we can offer them is 100, um, and especially if the house is in pretty decent shape, we like to tell them, well, look, I mean, we buy properties in two ways. Uh, either we're buying them all in cash, typically to add some value to it, do, so, do a, a fix and flip and put it back on the market. Um, but your house, I mean, your house, obviously it's in, it's in better shape than most of the houses that we fix and flip. Um, we probably have to purchase this somewhere around a hundred thousand cash, but we could make the $150,000 price work if you were to take, if you were to take payments on the property. And a lot of the time, then they ask, well, you know, what does that mean? Or how does that look? And that's kind of how the conversation evolves from there. But yeah, we, we always are starting with cash. And then if we find out that somebody's not going to be a good fit for a cash offer, that's when we switch to the, switch the conversation to seller finance. I love it already, Nick. We've got, there's two ways that we buy properties. Fantastic, right? Cause it's, it's giving them options and it's saying, Hey, listen, let's not close the door. You know, I think I can get to your pro your price, but it'll have to be in payments. And if they say, well, what does that mean? This is the sticking point that I see all the time is, okay, what does that mean knowing how to effectively communicate at this point? So what do you say? So we basically, we just tell them that instead of us going out and getting a loan to purchase this property, we make you the bank. So we just, we come up with terms that make sense for both you as the seller and me as the investor in terms of you know down payment, monthly payment, loan term, um, we just structure that between the two of us so that I don't have to spend all this money going and getting a bank uh, or getting a loan from a bank and dealing with all that. Instead, I can pay you the money that I was going to pay the bank and you know interest and other stuff like that. I can just give that to you as the seller and it's a win-win for both of us because you're getting a higher purchase price and I don't have to go get a bank loan. I don't have to um, you know deal with all the credit checks and all the stuff that comes with purchasing a property through a bank. 
Um, so yeah, we basically just frame it as, hey, well, um, you know, payments is, that's just us making payments to you every month rather than us making payments to, you know, Wells Fargo or Chase or whoever it may be. What, what if they say, well, I don't want to take payments for too long? Um, well, what we do is we usually say, well, that's fine. We can, uh, we figure out, or I'm sorry, we'll, if they say that they don't want to take payments for too long, we say that's fine. A lot of people don't. They don't want to be paid for, you know, the next 30 years. So what we'll do is we'll stretch out the payments, but we'll include a balloon period in there that allows you to get all of your money back in a lump sum at like a certain amount of time. So we'll give you, for example, if you want $150,000, we'll give you $10,000 down right now, and then we'll pay you X amount every month for the next, say, eight years, 10 years. And then at the end of that, whatever else we owe you, whatever's left on that balance, on the on the loan balance, that all comes due at that point. So then we pay you off the rest. And uh, we like to we like to frame it as as you know, some people they want to be cashed out in the next five to seven years, and some people they they don't mind holding the note for the next 15, 20, 30 years because some people like the fact that they can um, they can hold on to that passive income and they can even pass it down to their family. You know, if it's maybe an older seller or something like that, they can pass down the note to their family to where they can just, they can turn it into real passive income for them. It's an asset still. That's it. That's it. It's you an turn asset the property, still you turn the property into a note. So especially it works really well with people that are landlords that are sick of being landlords or, you know, maybe they just want to be, they want to retire. They want to get out of the landlord business, but they like the, the, the passive income aspect of it. It's a win-win for them. So, Whenever I'm talking to my acquisition manager, Ryan and Chad, um, and they're, they're saying, well, I think this could be a creative deal, I always ask them three questions, right? How much do they want down? What's the monthly payment? Which is which? we'll play around with that because that's how many years it's amortized or interest only or how much interest you're paying, right? And then for how long? How long are they willing to be the bank before they want what's called the balloon payment? And that was always a weird term. Was that ever a weird term to you, Nick, when a balloon payment? Like, I never understood that. It was like, why? What's a balloon payment? I, I just feel like it's like, okay, this is when the, the, they want all of their money. Right. Is, that, is right. that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So it's just, just when they want to get cashed out. Exactly. So in this situation, if we were to give them 150000 with a $10,000 uh, down payment and then say the balloon was in seven years that just means that we're going to pay them just for raw numbers let's say 500 bucks a month for the yep. next seven years and then at that point whatever is left on the loan between interest and principal we just that all comes due and at that point as the investor you'd either sell the house uh, refinance or do something else to pay off that seller at that point love it um, what happens because this is this is what we see commonly, and, and and people will literally Nick put this on our MLS as owner financing available, but they typically in their mind want twenty to thirty percent down, at least, right? And then they want to be cashed out in a year. The rest of it, <laughs> right, right. It doesn't make any sense. So right. if somebody wants a significant amount down, how do we how do we effectively? negotiate that back into something that's more reasonable. Cause we, when we look at it, we try to, we 10% is like our max, but we really try to be under 5% down. And, and I'll explain why later in this episode So stick around. Um, but we try to stay under 5% down payment, right? So if the property's 200,000, I don't want to be putting more than $10,000 down. How do you, how do you negotiate the, the percentage? If they're like, well, sure, 20%, 25%, 30% down, uh, and we can do this deal. How do you negotiate that? So at that point I tell them, and I'll be blunt with them. I'll be like, I mean, here's the thing as an investor, especially as a creative finance investor, I'm looking to get better terms than I can at a bank. So if you want 20, 30, you know, 35% down, plus you want a short loan term, what is the reasoning for me to use you as a bank rather than just going and getting a loan where I can put, you know, 20% down max and then have a loan for the next 30 years or whatever it may be. Um, so we just tell them, look, we're trying to, we're trying to get better terms in a bank. We have no problem with paying your purchase price. That's probably retail or, you know, just under retail or whatever it is much higher than we could pay as a cash, uh, as a cash offer. Um, we have no problem paying retail for properties, but we have to have terms that make sense for us. And for us, that looks like better terms in a bank, i.e. five to 7% down payment. You know, I tell people that we like to be all into properties, 10%, uh, max being between the down payment, closing costs and realtor commissions, if there are any, 
Um, and that's not necessarily like, and I tell, I tell the students this a lot, that's not exact, that's not necessarily like a hard and fast, like if it's 10%, if it's more than 10%, it's not a deal. That's just something to kind of anchor people. Like I'll tell them it's kind of how you, how you have, uh, the rule where you hit them with, what is it? 65% of Zillow when they're like demanding yeah. an offer. It's just hit them with 65% of Zillow. That's kind of just to see like where they're at. If they're going 50% to play ball. now in this market, but yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's, um, that's our way of just kind of seeing if they're going to play ball, if they're going to be even close to realistic. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, we just tell them we need better terms than a banker. There's no reason to use you guys as the bank. And if they say, well, then just go get a bank loan and buy my property at 150,000. Um, I tell them that there's uh, um, origination fees, you know, certain amount of interest, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. I can't purchase properties at retail with a regular lender. If I bought properties at retail value with a regular uh, financing, I'd go out of business. That's not a, that's not a way to invest. So I'll tell them that. And that kind of like flips the conversation like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like you can't just be paying Zestimate prices as, a, as an investor. You're going to go out of business. So I tell them that, it. it's it's the same thing. I tell them that either it's your terms at my price, meaning like, you know, quick close, no inspection, um, all of that stuff, your terms, okay, but that's gotta be at my price, meaning, you know, 50% of the ARV. Or if you want your price, that's fine, but it's just gotta be on my terms. So it's mm -hmm. kind of your pick. Do you want your price or do you want your terms? I love it. And do you have that conversation with them? Mm -hmm. All the time. That's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it puts you in the driver's seat, but you're being, you're being very uh, brutally honest with them. You know what I mean? You're not tr trying to drag it out. You're not trying to, you know, convince them to, to take something that they're uncomfortable with. You're like, listen, it has to be this. I am an investor. If you want to sell this retail, I totally understand to somebody that's going to live in this property and they're going to, you know, um, you know, pay a con on a conventional loan and get an appraisal and get an inspection and, and you have to go through and make sure that it, passes the appraisal and the inspection. Totally understand. Go do that. Put it on the market. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about these properties that people want, want that, that are in distress still, right? Are you, or are you targeting properties that are just regular run of the mill, any property? Like you would call on any property or knock on anybody's door and be like, Hey, you know, would you sell your house and then start talking terms to them? Or do you laser focus on still distressed properties? So we definitely focus on distressed properties. Um, we were trying to target distress, but the thing that I love about seller finance is that it doesn't have to be a distressed situation. Um, it's a lot of the time you're looking for sellers that they're stuck on a price that they can't get from other investors. Um, and they may be, especially the best avatar for somebody for seller finance is somebody who's very price motivated, but doesn't need all the money right away. Or maybe right. they're, and it's even better if they, if they are worried about the tax implications of selling their property because there's you know tax benefits to selling the property on seller finance um so that's kind of the avatar that we look for obviously with cash it's, it's the exact all avatar it's the exact avatar that we typically find in wholesale right right, right. i mean these are typically wealthy people mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I said it's perfect for landlords. Perfect for landlords. They've, you know, maybe they bought this property back in the back in the seventies or eighties for fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and they've just been renting it out for for however long. And now they're looking to retire, get out of the business, whatever it may be. And uh, but they don't want to give up the they don't want to give up the passive income part of it. And also, they know that if they sell that thing for cash, they're going to have a huge capital gains tax bill um, in this in that year. Do they, do you ever pull lists of people that just are, have a hundred percent equity? They own the property free and clear. Do you ever just target those people and just see if you can make things happen? We have a little bit. I, I I'm not going to say that there's, we haven't done it enough to where I could say like this works or this doesn't work because like I yeah. said, every, all the seller finance leads that we get, it's through the wholesaling marketing funnel. So we're, we'll pull, we're, we are pulling distressed lists. Um, so we're, we're marketing to distressed sellers, but a lot of the times maybe they'll have a house that we call about, but they have another house that they might want to sell. And that one's, you know, in good shape. It's, you know, maybe tenant occupied, they're getting rid of the tenant, want to sell it, but don't want to take the, you know, the offers at 50% of ARV that most people are offering them. Um, but no, we don't, we don't specifically target, 
um, like free and clear houses or anything like that. We just find them in our regular outreach. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, and the point of this podcast, guys, is just to give you the extra tools when you are having these conversations with these tired landlords that there is potential there. They just don't want, they just, they're too savvy to, or, or just not, they don't want to trade the, the potential equity for speed and convenience. So they're willing to take these payments over time. That's where the creative finance comes in, which is absolutely incredible. Let's talk about the second part, monthly payment, right? So first we have down payment. We try to keep that around 5%, under 10%, uh, hopefully depending on the, the, the value of the property. Uh, and depending on – real quick, before we move on to the, to the monthly payment, how much does the condition of the property affect – the down payment and monthly payment for you? Um, down payment, it affects it. That's like the biggest thing. Because I'll tell people if the property is turnkey and I can just close on it and put a tenant in there, then I might be okay with paying, you know, uh, bringing more out of pocket for the down payment. Um, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the ROI, the cash on cash return. What does this down payment, eat? you know, this down payment will get me this much in rent. What is that on a yearly basis on an ROI standpoint? Um, but I'll tell sellers all the time, like if their house is, if their house needs a lot of work, it's usually we're trying to get it for no money down or very, very little down. And we just tell them like, look, we usually, we advocate about 10% of the purchase price to our, you know, what we call the entry fee to get into the deal. Um, and if we, if, if the property is completely turnkey, we might be able to come up a little bit on that because, you know, if the pro like I said, if I can just close on it, put a tenant in it, it makes it a little bit different. But if the, if the property needs some work, then I have to take the money that I could allocate to the down payment. I have to put that into the rehab. So that's kind of, that's kind of how we anchor sellers at that point. And again, yeah, it's I, like, it, again, it's all like, this is what we need to do to be able to pay your Zestimate price, asking price. You know what I mean? The house is right. worth 350 because Zillow says it's 350. I have to buy this for 225. But if you really want 350, I can do that, but I have to do it at these terms. Love it. Um, I, <laughs> I said before that I would buy any property for a million dollars in, in a city. Let's not talk about like rural land, but in a city, I would buy a property for a million dollars if I could pay him a dollar a month. Right. Exactly. Right. And so the, the, the monthly payment. I mean, listen, we're not a price society. We're a payment society. So the monthly payment is really important. What I have um, told my guys is look at the Zillow rental estimate, okay? And our payment needs to be about half of that, okay? So that, that gives us enough room to be able to get a tenant in there, get decent cash flow, but cover all the other, you know, ancillary costs that we have uh, involved there. And, and it, that, that is kind of the sweet spot. Do you look at, how do you look at payments? Is that's, there a calculation? Is it? That's pretty much exactly how we do it. Like at least from a, at least from a uh, initial conversation standpoint to make sure that you're on the same page as the seller. Cause you know, some people, a, a tired landlord, they might say, well, this is making me $2,000 a month in rent, so I want $2,000 a month you know, payment right. from you if I sell this on seller finance. It's like that just you know, it doesn't make any sense because after no. taxes, insurance, property management, I'm losing money. So yeah, we, we typically look at it the same way. It's if, we can, if our payment to the seller can be roughly half of what we can bring in in rent, then you know that after taxes, insurance, property management, and your capital expenditures – you're going to most likely you're going to have some cash flow, uh, some net cash flow after that, and so it's a good general rule of thumb to be at about half. What sweet spot? Thirty percent, forty percent. I would say yeah. I mean, to, I mean, if you can get a deal to where your monthly payment to them is like twenty five, thirty percent of the rent, then obviously you're gonna have a you're gonna have a smoking deal. One thing that a lot of people don't think about. Um, and it's something that I learned with actually a property that I had to let go of a couple days before closing because I didn't realize this until the very end was that the taxes, especially if it's a property that hasn't been sold in a long time, like let's say they, they bought it for $80,000 20 years ago. Now they're selling it to you for $350,000. Your taxes are going to go up. So you have to, you have to keep that into consideration. But as far as a monthly payment to the seller, yeah, I mean, sweet spot would be 30%. But as long as you're 50% or under, you're probably at the area where it, it 
could be a deal depending on some of the other terms. I love it. I love it. That is such a good point because it's going to record at that higher price and then that's going to affect the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to affect the property taxes. And uh, that's something that you definitely have to budget in there, especially in some of these states that have tremendous property taxes. Um, you know, Illinois, New York, California, some of these, some of these states that have big populations. If you're doing this, if you're able to put together these, um, creative finance deals, make sure that you understand and kind of estimate what your property tax payment is going to be for the year divided by 12. So you know what it is monthly and, uh, and that'll affect, um, you know, the payment that you can give to that property owner. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, I'm older. I own a hundred properties, got them all paid off free and clear. Somebody's going to pay me 25% of the rent to just, uh, to not own them anymore and not deal with them anymore and not do anything with them anymore. And I've got this asset that they're going to pay me over time. And there's, there's a balloon payment that they're going to have to pay me this big amount in say 10 years. Uh, that sounds pretty awesome. Mm hmm I mean, I like it's to tell people. I like awesome. to tell sellers. I like to tell sellers. Um, have you ever wondered why banks own every you know skyscraper in every city yes. in America? Because they make money off every single real estate transaction. Without you know, I mean, there's risk obviously involved, but if you're not involved with the management of the property. You don't have any ownership responsibility. You're just collecting monthly payments every single month, and then, it's like the you said, you get a lump, a lump payment down the road. Well, and it's really interesting if you really look, and this is kind of just, I'm going to just skirt off here for just a second, but I was looking at the amortization schedule. You can look it up on any, you could just Google it and you look at, okay, the first 10 years, really the first 20 years of payments on a 30 year amortized loan is interest, right? So you can look at this thing and you're like, wait a second. You know, I'm not even paying off anything until year 20. The average homeowner owns a property for seven years. You're, you're literally only paying interest to this bank. Your full payment is going towards them. And you're like, this is how they just grow incredible wealth. I mean, you could, you could, you could work out a deal with an investor where you pay only, you know, interest only payment, balloon note at some point, and, um, and, and, and it's just all pure pure profit. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you could really structure a win-win situation with these creative, um, with these creative deals. And the reason I bring this up on wholesale hotline is because a lot of times, if it's a property, uh, that's not in a neighborhood that I want to buy here in Phoenix, we wholesale these deals and they go faster than a traditional wholesale deal. You, it, it will spin your head how fast these go. Uh, these go. I mean, it is absolutely bananas. We, when we put out a creative finance deal with really good terms, uh, our, it, they're smaller fees on a regular cash deal. We earn about $38,000 a deal. These are closer to fifteen dollars to $20,000 a deal. But holy cow, we got like 40 offers. You know what I mean? Everybody wants that deal. Everybody and you can't it. really negotiate it too hard because, you know, the terms will start to affect it. But what you do is that's why we like the 5% down for us because an investor is going to look at this and say, okay, if I got to come in and I put 10% or 13 or, or 15 or 20% down, um, but they're the, the notes already there, that's more affordable for them. They can save up, more, save more money for repairs. They don't have to have a tremendous amount to get into this property. And remember, these are rental portfolio buyers. These are not fix and flippers typically. So they're just thinking the long Long term, long plan. I'm going to get this property. It's not going to be on my credit. It's not going to be a conventional loan because you can only get you you can only get like ten conventional loans um, per per person, twenty per couple, depending on the the real estate market at the time. And then your interest rates really start creeping up. So you only have ten golden tickets to get the best financing that you can from a conventional bank before you have to get creative if you want to own all these properties. So they go, okay, wait, I don't have to burn a golden ticket. I'm getting incredible interest rates on this. It's going to cash flow. And I only have to come in with like 20% down on these things or 15% down on this deal. And I've got this incredible loan. I, I mean, people gobble these up, Nick. Yep, absolutely. They gobble them up. Are you just keeping all these? Or are you wholesaling any of them? 
Um, I'm keeping the good ones for sure. Um, yep. <laughs> the ones that are too good to pass up, I definitely keep those myself, but um, I'll sell anything that doesn't necessarily fit my buy box. Like if it needs a decent amount of rehab or um, if it's a wood frame house in Florida, that's a huge thing. The wood frame versus um, versus the block homes. Block. So I have yep. a buy box, but anything that's outside of my buy box, yeah, we'll sell that. Awesome. And the last part of this is the length. What is the shortest term that you're willing to do? Um, before the market shifted, I was saying like seven years. Um, now, I mean, I would maybe do a five-year balloon before the market shifted. Now that we're in a market that's very different, I just tell sellers, look, we're, we need to be at at least seven, most likely 10 or more, um, unless we're walking into equity. I'll tell sellers like, well, we're okay with the shorter term if we're walking into equity. And then another thing that we do that I've, I've, I've done a few hey, times. Wait, 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 real quick. Explain what that means, walking into equity. So like if they, if they want 275000 but the house is worth, you know, maybe 315, 320 to where if we needed to, we could sell it and at least break even or, you know, make a profit. Basically, we want to make sure that we're not in a situation where, you know, the five years comes up and we owe them $200,000, but the house will only sell on the market for $205,000. And after closing cost commissions, we're losing money. Um, so yeah, typically with most deals, I'm saying at least 10, sometimes seven, if we're walking into some equity. So let me give some guidelines to everybody here. When you're looking at these deals, this will simplify it. Okay. You you want to be no more than 10% down. Okay. Really you're shooting for 5% or less. You're looking for sweet spot is 25% of the Zest, uh, of the Zillow rental estimate, or you can go to uh rent -o meter rent -o meter and check it out uh, and get a more accurate number there. If you really want to get analytical with it uh, up to 50% and then your, the length of the loan, the, the, the balloon payment is no less than seven years and you're really pushing for 10 years. So the best deal ever is you coming in with nothing down. You're paying them 25% of the rental price and they give you a 30 year, um, which you can certainly start there if you need to, but um, in, in, in real life, those are the terms guys that you can go out and you can make a really big impact. And these are for the, for those property owners that are not going to budge on those properties. They own it free and clear and, um, and, and, and they don't necessarily need all their cash out right now. And it happens every day. And I'm telling you, Nick's not doing it right now, but I bet you guys can pull lists of people that own their properties for over 10 years. They have 100% equity. They're in area zip codes, school districts that are really popular in your area. And you could call them up and offer them a, 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 an incredible uh, creative finance opportunity. And they could be the bank. You could turn a lot of people into the bank. And listen, as the people get older, they just don't, they want to take everything off their plate. So let them be the bank and, 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 and create a incredible win, win. Nick, you are incredible. Um, every, what is it? Is it Wednesday that you do your creative finance call with the Rhino yeah, tribe? Wednesday at noon. Every Wednesday, he's in the Rhino Tribe community, pouring in. People love it. They're learning so much. There's so many creative deals that are being wholesaled right now in the Rhino Tribe, and we love them. We love you, Nick. You're absolutely incredible. How can people reach out to you? Uh, so you can uh, reach me on Instagram at, let's see, I don't even know what my Instagram tag is. My Instagram tag is Nick underscore Camrata. So just my first First name underscore camarada. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm probably most responsive on Instagram. We'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the uh, notes on YouTube. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for being on here. You're absolutely incredible. That was huge. It, I'm telling you guys, this next at least two to three years could be four being able to use this, I mean, you could use this strategy in any market. This is a tool in your toolbox that'll you that that that'll that'll be worn and it'll be one of your favorites. And I'm telling you, you don't have to you don't have to be scary uh, scared talking the terms with 
um, with these property owners. If you use this podcast, listen to it over and over and over, write down what we said, write down those guidelines on the down payment, the, the length and the monthly payment, and you will go out and do some incredible deals that you didn't think that you could do because the price was too high. Yes, right, Nick? Absolutely. Every day, right? Absolutely. Every day he's doing these deals. It's absolutely incredible. That's it, guys. That is the show. You know it. If you are interested in joining the most proactive community in real estate investing, it is the Rhino Tribe. Go to wholesalinginc.com. Check it all out. That's at wholesalinginc.com. There's a link down below. There's a link everywhere. You can check us out. Uh, see what it's all about. If it feels good in your gut, make sure that you sign up for a call. See if it's the right time for you to join these incredible rhinos running around all over the country doing amazing deals and learning directly from Nick every Wednesday. That's it, guys. That is the end of the show. I will sign off, as always, encouraging you to go out there and talk to people. Till next time. Love you guys. See ya.